Thank you to Brilliant for supporting PBS. The weird rules of quantum mechanics lead to all sorts of bizarre phenomena on tiny scales. Particles teleporting through walls, or being in multiple places at once, or simultaneously existing and not. But wouldn't it be cool if we could see some of this magical behavior at the human scale? Well, today I'm going to teach you how. All you need is the second most abundant element in the universe and absolute cold. Or if you don't have those, the corpse of a dead star will do just fine. Perpetual motion machines are all scams, but perpetual motion itself is possible, sort of. If you stir a cup of tea, you'll create a vortex that slows down over time, but there's a type of fluid in which the vortex will never stop, at least theoretically. Even unstirred, this fluid will climb the walls of the cup by itself and even leak through the microscopic channels in the otherwise watertight porcelain. The fluid in question is liquid helium cooled to near absolute zero when it becomes an exotic state of matter known as a superfluid. Superfluidity is the most characteristic behavior of the bizarre state of matter called a Bose-Einstein condensate. This is a state of matter in which the weirdness of the quantum world invades our large-scale reality. To understand this, we do need a bit of background. And that background is our last episode where we talked about how the behavior of matter depends on how nature counts its particles, described in the field of statistical mechanics. Watching that episode either right now or right after this episode will really help you understand this phenomenon. We'll also be referring to this episode, but that one you can definitely watch afterwards. First though, let's recap a little of what we learned in that last episode. We saw that we can understand a lot of the behavior of matter by counting the number of different ways in which particles can be divvied up into available energy states. Particles will tend to shuffle energy between each other until they have the most probable energy distribution. The shape of that energy distribution determines the thermodynamics, which means how things like temperature, pressure, volume, etc. relate to each other. We also learned that there are different types of particles, bosons and fermions, which shuffle around their energies differently. To remind you, no two fermions can occupy the same quantum state, which means they can't have exactly the same energies. On the other hand, any number of bosons can occupy the same state. In everyday life, this difference doesn't matter. Everything else being equal, a cloud of bosons and a cloud of fermions behave the same. But there are circumstances where the differences become very important. And that includes the world of the very small, the quantum world, but also the world of the very cold. There, the quantum behaviors of these different particle types are as clear as day. In our other previous episode, we talked about the reason for the different behaviors of bosons and fermions. We saw how quantum spin determines the symmetry of the wave function. And it's this symmetry that determines whether two particles are allowed to have identical wave functions. However, that episode was on the mathy side and also focused on fermions. For now, I want to try to give you a more intuitive view and one that lets us understand the behavior of bosons, which after all is what we need to understand superfluids. In quantum mechanics, we describe particles as wave functions. These are mathematical objects that encode the probability that we will observe a certain position, velocity, whatever, if we were to try to measure it. Wave functions are well-named because they're wavy. For simplicity, Let's just look at one component of a particle's position wave function, representing its blurry quantum location in space, which might look like this wave packet, a sine wave that tapers off on either side. The height of the wave function at any point represents the probability of the particle actually being in that location. Now let's think about two particles moving together. At a certain point, their wave functions will overlap. And what happens then depends on the symmetry of the wave function. In this context, when you have a symmetric wave function, then when those particles are in the same quantum state, their peaks and valleys line up perfectly. A pair of symmetric wave functions can stack, doubling the height of the peaks and the depths of the valleys. However, in the case of the antisymmetric wave function, if you put the particles in the same quantum state, the peaks of one wave function will line up with the valleys of the other and vice versa. In that case, overlapping wave functions causes the entire thing to cancel itself out, 
with the peaks of one negated by the values of the other. In the case of the symmetric wave function, all of this is straightforward enough to interpret. The fact that they can stack without cancelling each other out means that particles of this type, bosons, can be placed in the same state without breaking any physics. Fermions, on the other hand, with their anti-symmetric wave functions, appear to cancel each other out. If the wave function encodes their possible positions in space, then when they cancel out, it seems like there's a zero probability of either particle being anywhere. That doesn't mean that a pair of fermions destroys each other. That would break several conservation laws from conservation of energy, conservation of charge, even of quantum information. A wave function can't just be deleted from the universe. So rather than telling us that fermionic wave functions cancel each other out when they overlap, this cancelling effect actually tells us that fermions cannot ever overlap perfectly. They can't occupy the same quantum state. In fact, if you try to push the same type of fermion into the same state, they will resist with a force so powerful that, for example, it can help a dead star resist collapsing into a black hole. But that's another story. This way of describing the difference between bosons and fermions is extremely heuristic. It's heavy on analogy and shouldn't be interpreted too literally. For one thing, the part of the wave function that's symmetric or anti-symmetric doesn't look like a simple sine wave. It's the part of the wave function associated with the rotational state, not the position state. It's connected to particle spin. In fact, spin defines whether a wave function is symmetric or anti-symmetric. All particles with values of quantum spin that are an integer, so 0, 1, 2, etc., are symmetric and are bosons. However, those with half integer spin, half, three on two, etc., are anti-symmetric fermions. For a more nuanced description of this, including a lot more of this spin stuff, check out that episode. But for now, let's just take one critical fact from all of this. Bosons with their integer spins and symmetric wave functions can be stacked. Fermions with their half integer spins and anti-symmetric wave functions cannot. And by the way, all of the elementary matter particles, everything that makes up physical stuff, is fermions. The inability for them to perfectly overlap is why physical stuff is physical in the first place. For example, atoms have structure because electrons can't fall into the lowest atomic orbit altogether. On the other hand, photons and other bosons can overlap completely, and that's what makes lasers possible. A laser beam consists of many, many photon wave functions that are perfectly overlapping or in phase with each other. So what would it look like if we could turn fermions into bosons? Would it then be possible to make an electron laser? Or could we make atoms that collapse into super dense states? Well, actually we can turn some fermions into bosons. And one possible result is the Bose-Einstein condensate and this superfluid thing that I've been teasing for the past several minutes. Fermion wave functions have half integer spin. Multiple fermion wave functions that are somehow connected to each other have spins equal to the sum of those spins. So for example, a proton is made of three quarks, two with spin of a half and one of minus a half. Adding those up, you get a proton that also has a spin of a half, so it's a fermion. But what if we could connect just two spin half particles? That would give us a total spin of one, which is an integer, and so it should produce a boson. Or take the helium-4 atom, it has two protons, two neutrons, and two electrons, all spin half particles. In this case, three is spin plus half, and three is spin minus half, which gives the overall atom a spin of zero. That's an integer, therefore helium-4 must be a boson. Its component particles remain fermions, and behave as fermions with respect to each other within the atom. They have different internal energy states, but the entire helium-4 atom acts like a boson with respect to its neighboring helium-4 atoms. That doesn't mean they overlap in physical or position space. Their internal fermions would resist that. But the atoms as a whole can occupy identical energy states. We really only see the effect of this at extremely low temperatures. So let's do an experiment and cool down some helium-4. At atmospheric pressure and room temperature, helium is a gas. At this point, it wouldn't matter what that gas was. The shape of its energy distribution would look the same and would only depend on the temperature. But as temperature drops, 
four more particles move to lower energies. At around 5.2 Kelvin, the gas condenses into a regular liquid. But as we cool things down further, things start to look different. If this was a gas of fermions, the inability of particles to occupy the same energy levels would prevent all the particles from falling to the lowest energy states. That has its own bizarre effects, especially at high pressure, but we're talking about bosons here. For the bosonic helium-4 atoms, there's nothing stopping all particles from entering the lowest energy state. When we hit a temperature of 2.17 Kelvin, close to absolute zero, that's exactly what happens. Rather than having a distribution of energies, all particles have the same energy, the lowest possible energy. In fact, they can't have any other energy because at this low temperature, there isn't enough energy to jump to higher states, but they also can't lose energy. They already have the least possible energy in normal states of matter. When two atoms get close to each other, they repel each other, exchanging energy. Typically, one loses energy and one gains it. But when all the particles have the same energy, then interactions that require this energy exchange aren't possible. For example, a fluid made of such particles loses all friction. Normally when fluids flow, currents or streamlines within them that have different speeds within the fluid drag on each other. We call this viscous drag. That drag is caused by particles in the streamline boundaries colliding and exchanging energy, and it causes the flows to slow down. Such a fluid has viscosity. The higher the viscosity, the more drag, and the less easily the fluid flows. But the streamlines in very cold helium-4 don't exchange energy with each other. They slide past each other without friction, and so this fluid has zero viscosity. It is, in fact, a superfluid. And now, finally, we get back to stirring our cup of tea. Particle interactions with the walls and with each other cause the circular currents to slow down and stop. But if your tea is superfluid helium-4, then these interactions can't happen. Stir the cup and the vortex should last forever. Now, in reality, this would also require the walls of the cup to be perfectly smooth. However, according to this core simulation, when a superfluid flows around the microscopic bumps of a container wall, it forms tiny, perfectly flowing vortices that do actually slow down the overall flow, but in a different way to a regular fluid. By the way, saying that all particles in a superfluid have the same energy is a bit simplistic. Energy states can vary a bit across the fluid due to different speeds of its streams, different heights in the gravitational field, etc. But the point is that particles near each other are extremely close to having the same energy state and so are restricted in how they can interact with each other. There are a few other weird superfluid behaviors. Now, all fluids will creep up the walls of their containers a little due to the mild attraction between the atoms of the fluid and the container. But in a superfluid, the frictionlessness allows the fluid to literally flow up the wall, at least once that wall is coated with enough of the fluid itself to be frictionless. Then, when the flow drops over the other side, it can act like a siphon and it can drain your container of its precious helium-4. Superfluids also flow through microscopic fissures and pores in a container, causing it to appear to leak through apparently solid material. This Houdini-like nature of helium-4 reminds me of quantum tunneling, how quantum objects can teleport short distances through solid barriers. But this superfluid thing is not quantum tunneling. However, it is a true quantum effect, visible on a macroscopic scale. All of the behaviors of superfluids are due to the quantized nature of the energy levels in the fluids. Superfluids aren't just a novelty found in physics labs. They are believed to exist, for example, inside neutron stars, where the fermionic neutrons team up to act like bosons and they form these whirlpools from the surfaces of the star to their cores that hold insane amounts of energy. They last for a long time because superfluid, but when they finally do break, they are believed to cause the neutron star quakes that we see in the glitches of pulsar signals. And superfluidity is basically what electrons are doing inside the otherwise solid crystal lattices of a superconductor, as we showed in our episode on quasiparticles. In that case, the electrons connect with each other over large distances to form Cooper pairs, 
so that these fermion pairs also act like bosons, leading to a frictionless flow of the electrons. This manifests as superconductivity. At a more fundamental level, the fermionic quarks can join in pairs to become bosons, which allows them to serve as strong force carrying mesons. The bosonic nature of the Higgs field allows its particle to form a slightly different kind of condensate, one which fills the entire universe and which is responsible for giving elementary particles their masses. Now, I feel like we've pointed you to earlier episodes even more than we usually do in this episode. But yeah, we do have one on the Higgs stuff. But by now, I think we've realized that just like with bosons, there really is no limit to the number of overlapping references to past episodes of Space Time. Thank you to Brilliant for supporting PBS. Brilliant is an online learning platform for STEM with hands-on interactive lessons. Brilliant is for curious learners, both young and old, professional and inexperienced. Brilliant courses teach you how to think and solve problems with interactive lessons in STEM. And if you really want to deepen your knowledge, multivariate calculus is a fundamental tool that helps solve important problems in machine learning, neural networks, engineering, quantum computing, and astrophysics. In Brilliant's multivariate course, you'll begin by diving deeply into vectors and coordinates in 3D. And as you master them, you'll move on to mapping the bottom of a lake to understand multivariate functions graphing and contour mapping, You'll be guided through the math and develop intuition about how multivariate calculus works thanks to expertly designed problems, animations, and interactive three-dimensional visualizations. To learn more about Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash spacetime. Before I go, I wanted to let you know that we're having a problem with the YouTube algorithm, triggered by our comment response live stream a few weeks ago. Our subsequent episodes haven't been reaching nearly as many members of the Spacetime community, and we need your help. The two best ways to help are, one, click on the bell icon and select all notifications, not personal notifications. By doing this, you can make sure that you're always getting notified of every new episode of Spacetime on your homepage. And two, join the early gang and watch the episode as soon as you can when you see it. Early viewership is one of the best ways to keep the algorithm happy, which helps spread the episode to the rest of the spacetime community. We love the community we've built and want to make sure that as many people as possible see each episode and can participate in all the right discussions in the comments section. Thank you for your continued support. <laughs>